Hi, I'm Greg Banish from Calibrated Success, and welcome to our Learn at Home Tuning Training DVD series. In this series, we're going to look at how to properly reflash your General Motors vehicle using the HP Tuners software editing package. This software package gives us access to a tremendous number of tables within the powertrain control module. However, we're going to focus on a few key tables that give us the best results the quickest. Before we get too deep into the calibration procedure, we're going to look at how to use the scanning tool to properly acquire data from the vehicle while we're on a dyno or on the road. Learning how to properly acquire this data will make our job as a tuner much easier when it comes time to change the tables. So hang tight as we get our laptops ready, get our vehicle on the dyno, and we're going to start taking some data and making a little bit of noise. Let's open the VCM scanner and take a look at what kind of variables we can record when we're connected to the vehicle. There are a lot of PIDs and DMRs, both just technical terms for ECU variables that we can record and watch while we're driving or make a recording and come back and look at very carefully later as we examine our data logs. What we see on the screen here in the table display is a list of the basics that are already loaded in the default. Anywhere where you see the parentheses SAE, that stands for Society of Automotive Engineers, and really it's an OBD2 standard variable that you'll see. Sometimes you'll see duplicates of these variables in the pick list, and they may or may not have the SAE after them. The SAE is generally the lower resolution of the two because that's an OBD2 legal requirement to have that available for most scan tools. If we have a choice, we always want to pick the non-SAE version because that's going to give us a higher resolution recording while we're doing our work. Chances are, if you're looking to make some more horsepower out of your engine and you're getting serious, you're probably going to be changing fuel injectors somewhere along the way, especially if you're adding a turbo or a supercharger to your application. In order to install a new set of injectors, it's not just a mechanical installation. The ECU itself needs to know that we've changed from the factory injector up to this new fuel injector. Now that's more than just the linear flow rate of the injector. There are some differences between the construction of these injectors, and sometimes they have a different resistance, different number of windings inside the injector. The return spring that holds the needle closed on the seat in the injector might be different. All of these stack up to give us a different characteristic between how long we excite the circuit to these two pins on the injector and how long the fuel is actually flowing through the injector body itself into the engine. In addition to the injector flow rate, there are a few other critical parameters that we need to be aware of. There is some amount of time between the zero point where we first turn on the power to the fuel injector and when the injector actually begins flowing. This amount of time here is actually the injector offset. This offset is for different for each injector design and flow rate. So anytime you change fuel injectors, it's important to identify a new offset. This offset will also change in relationship to battery voltage. In addition to an offset and a straight line slope, we can see that there's a difference in between this dotted line, which represents our actual data points, and the white straight line that's drawn in there. If I take a closer look at that, we see that the low end of the fuel injector delivery curve is very nonlinear. In fact, it's almost two straight line slopes with a little bit of curve in between them and a little bit longer opening delay. What we need to do to identify this is identify the amount of time it takes to go from our straight line over towards this nonlinear behavior here that we actually get out of the injector. This is where the short pulse adder table comes into play. The short pulse adder defines the difference between a straight line relationship and this curve down here to get us to the actual fuel mass we want per unit time the injector is activated. This also changes with every injector design and flow rate, as well as tip design of the injector. So simply redrilling a smaller injector to flow a higher rate may give us a different short pulse adder table. And we won't know until we get some really good data from the injector supplier themselves. This is not something that we typically solve for on the vehicle. Okay, now that we have the zero KPA column properly characterized, We'll jump over to the 10 KPA because the spreadsheet doesn't have a 5. We'll come back to the 5 in a second, but we will grab the values for 10 KPA of vacuum 
from four and a half volts all the way up to 18 volts. So we'll go back to the Excel spreadsheet, this time to the 10 column, we'll highlight everything from four and a half volts all the way down to the 18 volt value. We'll right click, copy, return to the editor, select the 10 column, right click, and paste. Now we can see they follow the same trend as the zero column, and now we can take a good estimate of what the values for the five column will be. To do this, we're gonna use the interpolate function. So we'll highlight all three columns, zero, five, and 10, and all the way down. With all three of these highlighted, we can right click anywhere within there, choose the interpolate function, and in this case, we're gonna interpolate between horizontal bounds, which means between the zero and the 10, it will pick a five in the middle. And as I apply that, we now see that the five column is populated with values that are exactly halfway in between their neighbors on the left and the right in the zero and 10 columns. This gives us a constant trend, and we can repeat this process all the way out to the 80. Dyno safety should be first on everybody's mind before we even begin taking any data. When we bring ourselves to the dyno, we want to make sure that the vehicle, first of all, is in good working order. Make sure your tires are inflated properly, make sure that no fluids are leaking anywhere, and make sure there are no other mechanical issues with the vehicle. Basically, if you wouldn't race it on the track, you shouldn't be bringing it to the dyno. The only wires you should see when you're at the chassis dyno should be the wideband connection coming from underneath the vehicle, and perhaps the spark advance connection up here to allow the dyno to acquire engine speed. More importantly, we should also make sure that we're properly restrained. This means using wheel chocks both in front and behind the tires so that if we experience any bucking or surging on the dyno, these chocks can help hold the vehicle in place. Also, the straps at the front of the vehicle should also be firm and tight. Both front and rear straps should be used and they should be very tight such that they're not easily moved by hand. Also, since we're gonna be doing steady state testing, you see we've got a cooling fan directly in front of the radiator. In warmer months, if you're testing in the middle of summer, you may need more than one fan. Remember, all the steady state testing generates a lot of heat and things are gonna get warm, not only your engine, but also the exhaust system underneath the vehicle and we don't need an unwanted thermal event. As you can see, this vehicle has a different cold air induction system than it came with from the factory. From the factory, we have a conical filter, but we also have this silencer and a reduced diameter before the mass airflow sensor. After the mass airflow sensor, there's also a couple of additional silencers before the airflow enters the throttle body. Both of these are done from the factory to try and reduce the amount of emitted noise from the engine, but they also can sometimes restrict power. These aftermarket kits do a really good job of opening up the airflow to make a little bit of extra power, but a very important change is made when we add these. The change is that even with the same amount of airflow, the reading out of the mass airflow sensor to the PCM in frequency may change slightly. Now, I'm sure you've heard from a lot of people before that, hey, this doesn't matter, it's not that big of a deal. I'm here to tell you otherwise. This is probably the most important measurement that happens within the PCM. Everything that goes on within the PCM is based on grams of air. It may be grams per second or grams per cylinder event, but all of it gets calculated ultimately from this sensor right here when it's functional. Before we head to the dyno with this calibration, we first need to make sure that we're not hitting a moving target. Step one to making sure we're not hitting a moving target is to disable the closed loop operation. Remember that the factory ECU is always going to try and push towards lambda equals one, whether you're there or not. I don't wanna try and work against the computer's corrections. So the first step to get rid of that is to highlight the entire closed loop enable table. This table defines a coolant temperature where it allowed the computer to enter closed loop. I'll, re I'll enter some unreasonable value, in this case 500, and watch and see how it's rounded off to 306 degrees Fahrenheit. This is the highest possible calibratable value entered into the PCM, but it's also a value above any coolant temperature that I should encounter during normal operation. Since I don't get above 306 degrees Fahrenheit with my engine coolant temperature, this table will prevent the ECU from entering closed loop operation. With an open loop calibration, we also need to define a constant target. I don't want to hit a moving target, so part two to checking a moving target is to define my open loop air fuel ratio. The tables in the GM computers are generally in units of phi or enrichment ratio, which is one over lambda. 
Luckily enough, this camshaft's not too big to keep this car from idling at all, so we'll actually start getting data as soon as we start recording. Begin our connection. And we can see right away that we're a Lambda 86. And looking at the command, it's commanding Lambda 1.0. So our error is a same factor of 0.86. We're plotting this against where we're at in the main VE surface. And so we're bouncing between 55 and 60 kilopascals. So it's populating these tables with those values. Remember, 86 means we're about 14% rich. So we're gonna be reducing the airflow in this point in the adjustment later, and as a result, when we fire back up again later, the PCM with reduced airflow will calculate a re reduced amount of fuel to be delivered with it, which will effectively lean it out later. One of the first steps to getting idle to work correctly is to pick a proper speed. Idle speed is controlled by going to the engine tab idle tab, and target idle speed table. Looking at the main spark versus air mass and RPM table, we wonder where a lot of these values came from. We know that up at the high load and wide open throttle region, we have a pretty good idea how to come to these numbers by doing wide open throttle pulls on the dyno. But how do we come up with a value here of 34 degrees at 3200 RPM and 0.36 grams per cylinder? And the answer is that from the factory, they perform what's called a spark hook test. In this test, they start out by holding a constant speed and a constant load. So in this video, we saw the proper way to set up our data logging tool to collect data that's actually gonna be useful to us as a calibrator. We wanna make sure that we collect this data in steady state, so that's why we spent some good time here at the chassis dyno shop to make sure we collect useful data that we can actually use to populate tables the right way. In order to populate the airflow tables the right way, we learned the importance of setting up the fuel injectors correctly. This DVD contains some of the values for a lot of popular injectors, so be sure to copy those values across properly so that we know that whenever we make an assumption about correcting airflow in either the mass airflow sensor table or the volumetric efficiency map, that we're making those changes based on good data and good assumptions for fuel flow. That's a critical step, and remember that getting both the MAF and the VE tables correct goes a long way towards fixing some of those nagging drivability problems that we see a lot of people complaining about on the internet. If you spend your time wisely on the chassis dyno and collect a lot of that good steady state data, you'll find that lots of other issues with the car just fall into place and it makes the tuning process a lot simpler. In addition to our training DVDs like the one you just watched and our SA design series of engine management books, we also offer in-depth, hands-on seminars calibrated to take you to the next level. We go on the road with an EFI calibration seminar as well as advanced GM and Ford courses featuring small class sizes with hands-on solutions to tough tuning issues. For details, check us out at calibratedsuccess.com.